Twenty-seven men and women are confined in correctional institutions throughout New England. This one, Walpole, is a maximum security prison in Massachusetts. It has a population of five to six hundred men serving sentences of about two years to life. It would still be typical of the twelve major prisons in New England, except for some events in its recent past. A lockup, which lasted over two and a half months for some men, was answered with a general work strike throughout the institution. This was followed by an unprecedented strike and walkout called by the Correctional Officers Union. The guards, who are normally present in the corridors at all times, preferred to leave their positions unattended rather than see certain prisoners released from their long segregated confinement. The prisoners told us what happened. There was a, a warden here by the name of Raymond Perel, and uh, he was strictly security. And he came in here and he closed the prison down to December the 29th. And when he closed it down, he locked everybody in 24 hours a day. And they went from cell to cell, searched the whole place. We were locked up for 35 days without showers, clean clothing, visits, attorney's visits. Newspaper people couldn't get in here, nobody. During the 35 days, we were yelling and screaming in the cells and swearing at the guards as they were walking by. Guys were being taken out of their cells and they were being bundled by four and five guards and six guards at once. And we all could look out and look at these guys doing this. They really did a hell of a job on some guys. And that just made us stronger and stronger. And we would yell and scream at the guards, spit at them, throw urine at them, throw human waste at them. And when they let us out, uh, guys started burning desks and whatever belonged to the screws, they burnt. All the time, the guys were in the disciplinary blocks, nine and 10 especially, uh, still going without showers all this time. Anyways, when we finally got out, we made a demand that we wanted to get rid of Raymond Perel. They offered all kinds of different things to individuals. We said, no, we can't get along with a madman like him. The guards union called us into the situation, and they asked us for our cooperation helping get the prison back to order. The next day, a press release was sent to all the newspapers that the inmates were running the prison. We was called three times. Three times we sat down, three times we tried to help, three times we got stabbed in the back. We got called the fourth time, we didn't go. They were feeding us bologna sandwiches in the cells. All this time we were eating cold food. Breakfast was a bowl of cornflakes, powdered milk, and uh, uh, coffee like that you wouldn't even want to drink. Of course, the screws were making all this stuff. We don't know what they were doing to it, but we know at one time they were urinating in the tea, uh, believe it or not, and they were putting soap powder in certain foods and stuff like that. You could taste it. So we told them, okay, that's it, forget it. Right? We, we're not recognizing parole. We're not cooperating with anybody. We're not working or anything else. When it come down to it, Perel finally resigned. He couldn't take it any longer because we just would not cooperate in any manner, way, or form. Not an inmate would do a lick of work. And without inmates running an institution, working and keeping it clean, then how the hell are they going to run it? Now, when we did finally get out, our second demand was to release the men that were locked in nine and 10 blocks who had gone 78 days without showers, without ever coming out of their cells, without clean clothing of any type. All the guards got together and they told the acting warden at that time, uh, I forget his name, they had so many of them since then, they had about eight of them here, that if he released the men from nine and 10, that they would walk off the job. Before he even made a decision, the guards got together and walked off the job, which left nobody here. They're the ones that say they're in fear of their lives because they've done something to somebody. Right. Right. You should expect to be prized. Just put something on food. You have to beat them half to death, and you expect them to, when you come back in, to shake your hand or pat you on the back. I sure. I'd be scared too if I beat the hell out of someone in here. There's 500 of them in here. I wouldn't come back either. So we told them to get some outside observers in here as neutral coordinators, just to observe both sides. That that just might work and hold the place together, rather than people dying because it was right down to a dying situation. If the state troopers come in, somebody would have died. A lot of us would have died. I don't know if they would have died, but we certainly would have given it a good fight. When we visited Walpole, the prisoners had ended their work strike. The guards were still out, and we found an entire society at work. A very complex society that puts out official state documents, records in printed forms, building materials, light handicraft, license plates for the registry of motor vehicles, and 1,800 meals a day for its population. 
And so it has its workers, its employers, its organizations, its cooks, craftsmen, educators, even its artists, its administration, and its police. But this administration doesn't pay its workers any minimum wage. It doesn't offer them adequate job safety or health care or adequate education and job training. Twice a day, it locks them behind bars for a population count. It locks them up every night. And it has the power to lock them up indefinitely. But as a result of the last lockup and the unprecedented walkout by the guards, an organization of prisoners, the NPRA, or National Prisoners Reform Association, had emerged in a position of leadership among the men. We talked with NPRA members inside Walpole. Before Raymond Farrell came here, this was one of the most racist prisons in the country. This prison was terrible. You know, everybody was mad to wear Raymond Farrell because he abused our manhood, he abused with our families, he abused with everything. He did us a favor. He said, we, you know, you're all dirt, and we're going to treat you like dirt. He said, well, if we're all dirt, we're going to be dirt together. And that's just what we did. He, he created a unity, Raymond Farrell did. But a unity isn't nothing unless you've got self-discipline and education. So that's what NPRA did. They undertook the task of uh, educating the cons and teaching them what self-discipline was all about. Now, we educated the cons as to uh, not ripping off their brothers, not ripping them off for their personal property, because we are ripped off by the system. We're rip, ripped off for our, our families, our loved ones, our kids, our wives, our daughters. And now, if a con rips off another con for his personal belongings, he becomes what the system is. He becomes a pig, see? And so, we educate the cons as to not becoming pigs, to stay together in a unity. So we've got the unity plus the education and the self-discipline. Not only that, uh, in any prison you'll find rapes, we stopped at Walpole. We don't have no more rapes. Very seldom does a man get ripped off his personal property. Now, how we educate these men, we don't educate them but through brute force as a disciplinary squad would do. As a goon squad would go in and break somebody's head because he's stealing from someone or because he's raped someone or he's done something wrong, we will approach the person and we will educate him. We will embarrass him, so to speak, in front of his peers, all the men in the block, We'll call him in front of all the men in the block and ask him why he did it and educate him as to the fact that he's becoming a pig if he continues to act like that. M the majority of the men that we've talked to like that put their head down, would be greatly ashamed and would thank us and say they were sorry. You pat him on the back, give him a cigarette and say, that's all right, it's no big thing. Just be our brother as we're your brother. At the present time, we have, we have been recognized by the Department of Correction just as the NPRA sole bargaining power of the inmates in the in their population. What we're working for now is certification as a union here in Massachusetts. Hopefully we'll branch to Norfolk, Concord, Framingham, all the county jails uh, and across the nation. Uh, and when I say certification as a union, <clears throat> we want minimum wages. We want outside industries to come in here. Either that, you know, give us you know, the same kind of pay you would pay someone else to make them license plates. We want safety standards. A man could go into a shop, and many have done it, work one of the machines and take half his arm off. I've seen men with the whole hand gone. Young, young guys ain't not, not even supposed to be running the machine. 17 years old, his hand was gone. That's, we want that. We want, like the guards, they're not responsible. They can do anything they want in this institution and get away with it. If we become a union, like they're a union, we can take them to court for that. We're, we're being undermined constantly by the administration. Both sides. Uh, on both sides, right. The administration and the Department of Correction. They use certain tools against us. The Department of Correction has the furlough, which they use as a tool. Right now, no one's getting furloughs. So that's to bend the men. Later on, they'll start implementing furloughs, and the, the ones that they give them to will be probably the leaders, guys like us. And then they'll try to bend us to their will. We'll give you a furlough. Now you do this for us. You do that for us. That's already been tried, wasn't it? How are we going to fight that? How are we going to fight it? It's the same way we fought in segregation. They had me in phase one, and a lot of the guys in phase one, they asked us if we wanted to move to phase two. If we were good, we could move to phase two. We told them to stick phase two. We'd stay in phase one. That's how you fight it. Now they offer me the furlough. They say you have to do...